Our next speaker is Martin Tegner. He's a data science researcher at IKEA Groups. He works with data-powered AI to enrich the customer experience at every point of the customer journey. In his current research, he develops algorithms that provide personalized content with respect, with, while respecting fair use of the customer's data. The title of the talk is Data Privacy and Fairness in Recommender Systems. And I leave over to Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. So this is uh, some work I've been doing together with uh, a few co-workers, co Gustav, Sanya, Balash, and uh, Emil at uh, IKEA Digital. So, so I just start with a, a motivator for our work this time. Um, so in the beginning of this year, uh, our chief digital officer um, of Inca Group, uh, she, she made an um, announcement of the customer data pro promise. So this is um, this is IKEA's approach to ensure it's putting people first in all our data-driven processes. Okay, so I mean, every time uh, we use a mobile app or a, a web page, uh, we generate a lot of data and there is a high likelihood that this data is collected uh, and used for some value-creating intelligence, say. So uh, with our promise from IKEA, um, we will be more transparent on, uh, around how we use data. Uh, and, uh, and more importantly, uh, we will actually hand, hand back the control uh, over the data to the customer. Sorry, so, so you, you I mean, at any given, let's say, e-commerce store, uh, you interact with a recommendation system. Uh, and I'm sure we all know how, th how this works. So if I add uh, a Strandmon chair here to, um, to the shopping cart, I will get a list of similar items, items um, recommended to me. So in, um, in this case, uh, we use a um, recurrent neural network to model um, purchases or yeah, let's say sequences of items. Uh, so you, you can imagine this stream here uh, of uh, different items um, and the, um, the, the stream of items that is added to cart by the customer. Uh, and the um, network is then trained to predict uh, the next item uh, in this stream. Um, so we then take uh, a list of such predictions, and, and this is what we use uh, for uh, for making a recommendation to you. Um, so I mean, this is a this is a let's say a deep deep learning um, technique, and and I think uh, you know that I mean th there's been a lot of progress and success with deep learning uh, in the last few years. Uh, many good examples of that, but uh, the progress in some sense, it, it, it actually, it, it relies on, on these large collections of training data. So the power of the network is, uh, is that it can, you know, it can learn a very general mapping from an input to, uh, to an output, uh, and it can even learn to do this for unseen uh, data. Uh, but this, this learning is only enabled by, by large collection of data. So now this collection um, of customer data, it's not our choice anymore. Uh, if the customer uh, choose to opt out from collection, uh, we have less data from training. Uh, and the question is, of course, for us at IKEA is, um, what are the implications uh, of that? So we started uh, a study uh, on performance of the recommendation system. So we have we took about two years of uh, purchase data from twelve different markets, different ge geographical markets, uh, and the, the study, the experiment is it's quite simple. Um, if we have if you have um, hundred percent of the original training data, we chop that up in let's say ten buckets, uh, and we train the model to you know the first ten percent the next 20%, 30%. So we increase the amount of training data. Uh, and then we have a constant 
um, let's say, holdout validation set, and, and we test performance on the same set for um, for every uh, every uh, perturbation of the of the training data. Um, so there's a figure on the right hand side. I will go back to that figure in, in just a minute. So this immediately led us on, on to a discussion about what is performance for a, a recommendation system. Uh, and I mean, in classification, in, in you know the usual classification task, uh, there is there is a true uh, label or class. Uh, and it's quite straightforward to pick a measure uh, to um, to measure performance. And I mean, you can think about uh, classifying images, cats or dogs, and, and you always have the ground truth uh, when you evaluate your um, your your machine learning um, method or system. Uh, but in this case, I mean, we don't have that ground truth, um, so we we need to do something else. And and we use, let's say, a combination of different measures. Um, to try to catch or represent what is a good recommendation for the customer. So here's a couple of these measures, top K accuracy and catalog coverage. Uh, starting with top K accuracy, this is, this is an accuracy measure. Uh, we take a list of K recommendations, four in this case, uh, and we, we just record um, if this list, I mean, if the true next item uh, added to cart by the customer, if that item is in the recommended list, right? So um, on, the, on the graph here, you can see how the, this accuracy measure um, behaves when we increase the training, the size of the training data. Uh, this is, um, I think this is, this is what we should expect uh, for an occurrence measure. There is a steep, say, uh, a steep increase at the beginning, uh, and then there is some sort of threshold point uh, where uh, where the accuracy, um, uh, let's say, saturates or uh, at some some uh, some level, uh, and then there is just a slow increase uh, in in accuracy when we inc when we increase the data. So this is, I think, this is um, the, this diminishing uh, return uh, in some sense. This is what we should expect uh, from the system. Uh, on the other hand, for catalog coverage, um, there is first uh, quite early there is a peak uh, in this measure. So this measure um, is uh, uh, this measure measures how. Let's say we have the entire product catalog. Catalog there is about between ten and twenty thousand products, uh, and the me this measure measures how large proportion of that catalog catalog is actively recommended by the system. So the the um, performance peaks, and then it then it actually decreases if we add more training data, and. We, we believe this is this is uh, related to uh, this picture here, uh, the popularity. So this is uh, this is in, in this in this plot we take all products uh, and we count how many times they appear in the data set, more or less. The product that appears most times uh, achieves a score of one. And then the, the, the less often they appear, the, the lower the score, the relative score. So as you can see here, there is um, quite a lot of products, but it's just a few, a very few of the products is, is in the, let's say, the active set. It's a few products are bought quite often. Uh, and we believe that this catalog uh, coverage performance measure, when the system learns in the beginning to, um, oh, sorry, the, the the performance goes down when the system start, start when the network uh, learns how to recommend um, more or less the, the more popular products. So it kind of forgets about the other ones. And um, so here we have this sort of inverted relationship. More data is not necessarily better. Uh, and I mean, we were quite, let's say, optimistic about these results because depending on how, what's your preferences on the system, um, what what uh, behavior you like to um, 
well, what performance measure you like to optimize here, um, you're likely to find, uh, let's say, an optimal point uh, between these different measures uh, that does not require um, the full amount of, of training data, the maximum amount of training data. Um, so this, um, um, th from this we, we uh, I mean, we started um, continuing with another question is, uh, and that is, I mean, how can we, we have 12 different markets, can we lever leverage data from a secondary market to improve uh, a primary, the recommendation system in a prim primary market? So a common technique for this, um, uh, to get more data for training is, is to use transfer learning. So you take a related data set uh, with some common properties to the target data and you use that when you train the model. So we had 12 markets and to know which market is re relevant, let's say for Germany, uh, we constructed a similarity metric uh, to measure similarities in the purchase behavior. Uh, so we then compared the performance, uh, we transferred from a similar market, in this case we took Germany and Netherlands, there is a high similarity, uh, and then we compared that with a dissimilar market, like uh, in this case Spain, with a lower similarity. Uh, and yes, from this accuracy measure here, um, we, uh, we got quite positive results that you can actually improve the performance quite a lot just by picking a similar market. Uh, and just as an interesting note here, uh, if we take China on the bottom row, uh, we, we can realize that uh, this measure correlates closely with, let's say, geographical or um, cultural uh, similarity. So China had a really high similarity with Japan and South Korea, according to the measure, but basically all other countries in, in Europe, uh, we saw a very low similarity in purchase behavior. Uh, so we found that uh, quite interesting. Um, so the similarity measure here, it's, it's based on um, an embedding of the product catalog. And, and that embedding, it, it's, um, uh, we extract that uh, from the recurrent uh, network and that is a, a representation of the product catalog. So it maps every item to a real valued vector in some, uh, some vector space. Uh, and interesting or more important, the, the, the important thing about this is that the mapping is, is learned from the data, right? So geometry in this vector space has a meaning from, from the learning context. So just an example, uh, I took care of the Billy bookshelf uh, and I found a couple of products which were closest to Billy. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there is a, a, a single shelf um, really close to Billy. And the next, I think, next uh, closest product was Havsta, this uh, glass door cabinet. Um, so people tend to buy these together. Um, sorry, let me see. Yeah. So we yeah we used customer data to learn that product representation, uh, and since we have less data to work with, we um, I mean, we ask ourselves, um, is there other sources of you know product representation knowledge for product representation? Uh, so instead of learning from data, do we can we do it? Can we do it in other ways? Uh, and of course, uh, I mean, a related question to this is, uh, is that does every, every customer visit IKEA.com to make a purchase uh, or do they have other intentions? Um, and yeah, of course, we are IKEA. So we have a lot of this knowledge. We, we take information from, let's say, handcrafted organizations or representations of products and products features. And we can train embeddings by, you know, co-association between the products. So you can, you can use a Siamese network or, or something like that for that. Uh, and we also have, uh, we also have the IKEA catalog, which is packed with inspirational images 
So these are products put together uh, by home furnishing specialists. Uh, and from these images, we, uh, we actually use um, pre-trained VTG networks to, uh, we feed the images through these networks and, and then we can exp extract uh, an embedding, uh, an inspirational uh, embedding from that. Uh, and we also, I mean, we also realized that this, this in some sense reflect on different customer intentions. You might go to, uh, to the webpage to, as before, make a purchase, but you might go there for inspiration for your living room or, I mean, you might want to buy something, sofas or lamps or something by category. So we try to capture, capture here um, different intentions with your visit. Um, so we have, I mean, we have several different representations. Uh, and next question is, of course, can we tailor these uh, for you? Uh, in a, I mean, can we, can we, we like to rep, um, recommend products in a personal, personalized way uh, to you. So we did this, so we do this here uh, by transforming um, each vector representation um, to a probabilistic model. So instead of distances between um, distances between um, items, we have probabilities. A short short distance uh, uh, would would then represent represent a high probability. So the the formal model for this in this case is a Markov chain, uh, and we then we can then use um, so we have a set of several such Markov chains, uh, one for each intent or representation. Uh, and we can then use Bayesian inference to learn uh, which particular representation is best suited from, from your behavior. So this we, we do this continuously. Um, we record a couple of, uh, couple of clicks or item use, um, and then we update your personal distribution over these uh, representations, uh, we use that to serve recommendations. And, and just as a note, I mean, we do we we do this. We can do this locally on 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 device. Uh, we just watch your couple of actions, update the model, and, and then we directly dispose your data. So we don't we don't need to uh, collect um, your data for training or model serving or something like that. Um, and here is a, just, just as an example, a little toy, toy example. Uh, we tried to depict uh, three different uh, representations, uh, add to cart, product class, and room type. Room type. Uh, and then we infer this mixture probability to get, let's say, a weighted representation, which is you know, uh, tailored for you. Um, and uh, just to illustrate this, let's say that you watch a couple of Bookshelfers, and and we infer that this this must be um, a categorical representation in some sense. So we we continue to recommend you more bookshelfers, or uh, you take a chair and a sofa, and we might infer that this is you're actually looking at a living room type type of representation, and we start we continue to um, feed you with furniture for your living room. Um, continuing here, I mean. Um, so let's, I, I can see I'm short of time, so let's just wrap up. Um, we like to put people first in all data-driven processes and give back control uh, of the data. So this is less data for our, our um, scientists, data scientists and analysts, and we did investigate the implications for our recommended systems. And on the positive side of this is that performance trade-offs are perhaps not so bad, uh, depending on the performance measure. Um, we also investigated recommendations as product representations, uh, utilize that for knowledge transfer between markets. Uh, and of course, we have some strong knowledge uh, across IKEA of, of our products, and um, we use that uh, in Bayesian statistics or updating to um, construct a personalized model for you. Um, and at the end, a few, um, uh, just a few references, and thank you very much. 
Thank you, uh, Martin. N nice talk. It's it's uh, really nice to see how you try to solve the recommender problem with with very limited amount of of uh, data actually used. So it's really interesting to see. Uh, <coughs> Let's let's go to the couple of questions that we have received so far. Uh, yes. The first one is from Eric, um, Hi. and he's asking: Do you look at which product products customers actually buy, or just what they add to the cart? So in this case, I think in the different systems we do uh, we do both. But uh, the example I had in the beginning, this was actually added to cart. Okay. And th and that also goes for the first recommender system that you talked about in the beginning. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. And then also, uh, Jesper is asking, so we all know the IKEA catalog, and mm -hmm. given that the product catalog is a little bit hierarchical, hierarchical in nature, uh, with respect to representations, have you thought about different ways of, of handling that hierarchical nature of products in the representation, like using Poincaré spaces or something like that? Not, not directly. So, so let's say we have access to from different parts of IKEA, we have access to um, different organizations, uh, depending on uh, based on the product features. Uh, so, uh, so I just took took that as an example of either you know room type like living room or uh, a category like glassware or whatever. Uh, so we can use that with, uh, for example, side, uh, we can use that to construct uh, representations uh, while. I mean, from from the IKEA um, catalog, we we took images mm -hmm. uh, and fed them through. Um, um, for, we fed them through for, through um, pre-trained networks, and we extract embeddings from that. Uh, so, of course, there is the hierarchy. Um, let's say built into uh, the, the different um, um, representations we construct here. Yeah. So, is the representation in that Markov chain is that from those images, or are those from the recommended? Yes. System? Okay. Ah, nice. Okay. Both. Both. I mean, th that was just a simple way. So, let's say you have different embeddings or different representations. That was just a simple way to build a probabilistic model uh, to obtain this personalized. I mean, we did a we construct a, a Bayesian model uh, where we have these as let's say a mixture. It's a mixture distribution, more or less. Uh, so we have the mixture components from different representations through the Markov chain. Okay. Ah, interesting. <laughs> uh, so have you have you thought about active learning in this sense? Uh, because that's another wish way of solving these uh, data deficiencies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends a little bit on exactly what you mean with active learning. Something like I that the customer can click I like these things and then yes. through the rest of their session they will experience a personalized. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is so let's say if you if that's what you mean. I mean this is a, this is exactly an active algorithm in that sense. So every time you make a couple of clicks, I update um the mixture distribution. So I had a slide on that. It was one of the last one. So I, I update, updated this um, posterior over these different uh, these different representations continuously. Okay. Give me a few clicks, and I will mm -hmm. try to infer if you are an add to cart shopper or if right. you are uh, right. watching inspirational images. So, in so essence, yeah, it's, it's an, an active, active learning problem. way of handling the problem. Okay, cool. Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. cool. Yeah, those were the questions we had time for. I think. And thank you again, Martin, and very nice to see you. And uh, uh, you it was too, you <laughs> many years ago. Uh, and yep. uh, and uh, good luck in your work at IKEA. And thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.